Hello. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the things he said. And I know a lot of persons probably trying to figure out what that is, but we'll explain it in a few moments. We're going to give you a few moments to come in. And as you come in, we're going to ask you, can you share the live for us, please? I believe it's going to be an awesome and interesting night. This is what we call our version of the seven last sayings. But of course, you know, we like do things with a twist. We don't like do things normal. So you're going to hear from some phenomenal speakers. Um, they ain't got that long, but they can say what the Lord has given them to say according to the scriptures that they have, according to the sayings that they have. And I believe it's going to be phenomenal. So I want to give you a few moments. Go ahead and share, share, share. Invite some persons to come on. You know, all of us pretty much doing the same thing, have a lot to do. Um, right at home. So, you know, we welcome you to join us. Come join us. Come join us. Some come and join us. We have we have some phenomenal young voices who I believe we have some of our, 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 our morning regulars, our morning devotion regulars. If you know them, if you, if you like any of them, we have um, Master Cameron Roll coming. We have one D'Angelo Roll. He's coming. Roberta Thompson is coming. Then we got a, a, a little tree coming all the way from across the waters who's going to come and share. And we got one Tamisha Cash. She's coming. We have the very fabulous Brian Bain. He's going to be sharing. We have, um, and along with that, we also have Dawn Collie and they're all, they're all going to come and they're going to give their, their, through their eyes, what the seven last thing means. So we're not going to belabor it. Um, we're not going to take along with it. Um, it's it's going to be a hit and run kind of thing. It's going to be better jump in and get it. Our first speaker up, he is going to, I'm going to pull him in to come and he's going to join us. First speaker up is, we call him our 6.30 a.m. preacher. <laughs> That's our name for him, y'all. That's our name for him. <laughs> D'Angelo Roland, he's coming with the very first saying of Jesus on the cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And he is going to come and give us that through his eyes. Following him is going to be my love, my, my, my sweet chocolate, Brian Bain. And he's going to say, tell us about the truth about when Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So these two men are coming one behind the other, and they're going to just come and drop it, grab it as they drop it, and just receive whatever it is the Lord is saying. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Minister Audra. And thank you, our viewers, for joining us, uh, taking the time to join us. Um, we're going to get right into it. So right wherever you are, just you know, offer up a word of praise to our God, because he is worthy to be praised. Father, we love you. We adore you right now. So cause the words of our cause the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts together to be found acceptable in your sight. God, we love you. We praise you. We adore you, and we honor you even now. So uh, let's jump right into it. So I've been tasked with the with breaking down the first saying: "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." So I want to pick it up from Luke twenty-three at the thirty-first verse which reads, for if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. And when they came, and when, sorry, when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they were crucified with him. And the male factors, one on the right, one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast his lots. This familiar process of scripture denotes the topic of forgiveness. And just like Jesus, many of us find ourselves sometimes in a betwixt and between state, deciding whether we're gonna forgive this person or you know what, just forget this and say, you know, I ain't got time for this. But the reality is that many of us struggle with forgiveness as unforgiveness is a very, very common thing that runs through the body of Christ. But I just wanted to make this point that Unforgiveness can sometimes act as a very corrosive agent. And so sometimes that may, what a corrosive agent is, means that we hold these things in and that it eats away at us. But the scripture says, for if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? And I find it very interesting that Jesus highlights this scripture before he actually gets to the act of forgiveness. Though Jesus was innocent, we know the scripture, though Jesus was innocent, 
The people mocked him. The people hurled him. The people actually uh, mocked him and jeered at him, even though he was innocent, just carrying out his purpose. So just like many of us, sometimes we carry out our purpose and, you know, people are throwing rocks at us and people are actually making mockery of us and bringing us down. But can I remind you that even though in, in, in season, we have trees that bear fruit, that even though people, when they want to get the fruit out of the tree, what they do is they throw rocks at it. They take sticks and poke it just to get the fruit out of the tree. But can I remind you that the tree does not stop bearing fruit? Even though it's green, it's 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 fruitful, it's prosperous, it does not it does not stop bearing fruit. But the power that unforgiveness has is that what happens is when I started to study this particular scripture, I realized that trees rot from the inside out. So unforgiveness acts as a corrosive agent, and trees rot from the inside out. So what I find is that when we as believers start to hold on to unforgiveness and we start to hold on to the things that are not of God. It starts to contaminate the things on the inside. It starts to contaminate us, uh, a tree. Psalms 1, it says, blessed is, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scornful. We know the scripture. And it also goes on to say that, that he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. And in due season, and studying this, I, I just wanted to bring that up because, you know, it's awesome because... Jesus directly correlated a green tree and a dry tree before he carried out the act of forgiveness. And in studying this, Jesus also brought to my remembrance, the Holy Spirit revealed to me the story of the, the fig tree. Luke, Matthew, and Mark have an account of this, but in particular, Luke has it taught as a parable where Jesus goes into the vineyard and speaks to the dresser of the tree. And he says, behold, for three years, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumber it to the ground, right? And I find this is very interesting because many times that Jesus associated that he came to this fig tree and found it not bearing fruit. Though he found it in a state that it was planted in the vineyard, it was still perishing. He found it barren and unproductive. So sometimes, just like us, Jesus comes walking about us, trying to find fruit, trying to find us being productive in the vineyard, but our fruits, sometimes he come to find us barren, broken, and bitter. Our fruits are not productive. There's no manifestation of the things that we have been preaching, the things of love, the things of God. He comes to find no manifestation of it. And I think right now in the body of Christ, that's where the challenge is. We as believers have to find a way to let go of unforgiveness so that when the master comes to reward us, he can find fruit. Proverbs, Proverbs 11 and 30 says, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth much more than the wicked and the sinners. So therefore, we have to realize that unforgiveness can contaminate our ministry. We struggle. Sometimes we wonder and find out why we struggle in ministry, why we struggle in our prayer life, why we struggle in our devotion life. It's because we are holding on to the things that are not of God. The Bible says, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? He that have clean hands and he that has a pure heart. I hear the spirit of the Lord says he's coming back for us. He's coming back. He's going to walk among us to find fruit. But we have to make sure that we are, we are planted in a state where our fruits can bring Fourth season, can bear fruits can be brought forth in due season. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, they will know you by your fruits. What will your fruits say about you? What will your fruits say about you? Will the master come and find you being productive, winning souls? Out, out in the vineyard, because we know that the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Will the master come and find you? Come and find you being productive. I implore you today, let go of your unforgiveness. Let go of your unforgiveness and find it in your heart to love. Love. Love on those that despitefully use you. Love on those that make it difficult for, for everyone to love. The, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do.
if Jesus had not forgive those people, then everything he gave his life for would be in vain. Everything he gave his life for would be in vain. What will your fruit say about you? Will the, will the inability to forgive forfeit you your future? I implore you today, forgiveness, let it go. Hold on to the things that are of God. Let there be manifestation of your fruits, fruits of love, fruits of positivity, fruits of life. The fruits of the righteous is a tree of life. God is coming back to be, God is coming back to be the tester, walking through the vineyard, looking and see if your tree is bearing fruit in, in this season. So I implore you, let it go. Be encouraged, be blessed. Forgiveness, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And let your fruits speak life about you. Let your fruits speak about you. Be encouraged. Let go of the bitterness. Let go of the brokenness. That, that, thing, that, that, that thing that is holding you back, the, mess, the hurt, the hurt from a broken marriage, the hurt from a, from a wayward spouse, the hurt from wayward children, let it go. Give it back to God because you, forgiveness fortifies your purity. The Bible says only the pure in heart shall see God. Forgiveness fortifies your purity and also fosters productivity. So guys, be blessed, be encouraged. God, I pray today that everyone under the sound of my voice will find it in their heart to let go of that thing that, that, is, that is holding them back from making the next step to from taking the next step in life from taking the next step in ministry father i pray right now that they will release it release that thing to you god cast their cares upon you oh god lay it at your feet even now father that you father god can come and find them as available vessels being ready to be used by you god i thank you right now father god that this day in time father that they shall too see father god the need to forgive oh god to let it go that person on the job oh father god that in employer father god that 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 way with co-worker god that continues father god i pray right now that they have to forgive oh father god because we cannot make it further in life carrying around things oh god bondage is not of you oh god because your word says oh god wherever the spirit of god is even now so father god we thank you right now that the spirit of god will rest upon your people even now that they will be free even now god so father we declare it to be so god that today this day father god forgiveness shall be their portion in the mighty name of jesus we pray amen and amen Okay. Yes, yeah, so we're taking up from Luke 23 and we're sliding down to the 39, 38th verse. 39th verse, sorry. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Are you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since we are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are going, we are getting what we just deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay, in this scripture, um, we see that Jesus um, is hanging between two thieves on a cross. Uh, both thieves speak. Um, one says, um, Look here, you're supposed to be the Messiah. Save us and save, save yourself. The other thief says, um, look here, don't mind him. He says, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. One thief gets ignored. The other thief um, gets, gets Jesus' attention and Jesus speaks to him. Now, these two thieves are on the cross just along with Jesus. They're experiencing the worst day of their life. 
In fact, they're experiencing the last day of their life. And in, in this hard place, this tough time, both of them find the place to speak to Jesus. But only one gets answered. In fact, because Jesus like, totally ignored the first one. What is it that makes it so different for Jesus to answer one and ignore the other? Well, let's examine what they both said. The first thing, the first criminal said, save us and save yourself. And then the second criminal said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The first criminal asked something for himself. He asked, he wanted salvation, but he, he was asking on his terms. He wanted it done his way. The second thief said, just remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, he hit a nerve with Jesus. He said, he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, implying that Jesus is the king. And here is, 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 the, is the key that got Jesus' attention. Can you still acknowledge Jesus as king when you are on your cross, when you are in the worst and hardest predicaments in your life? Can you still acknowledge Jesus as king? Can you still salute him as king? Can you still have care and attention for his kingdom, even though you're in a rough place? And this is one of the things that, 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 that separated him from, from the whole crowd. It separated him from, from, from everyone there, that he was acknowledging and he was saying, this is indeed the king. I'm not saying this as a mockery. I'm not saying this as, as, as slander. See, because a lot of them were, were, were down there and they were, they were mocking him. They were calling him king and mocking him. Be careful what you mock, because sometimes you could be mocking your own miracle. You could be slandering your very salvation. Be careful to acknowledge God in everything you do. In, the, in this time, we got a lot of people saying, well, they should do this, they should do that. Well, why God should do this, God should do Be careful what you say. Allow God to be God, be king. Now, the, the next thing about it is, he, he could have been, he could have been, 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 been like in, in this rough situation. I don't want to hear nothing but God. I don't want to see God. But check this out. Maybe God had him in that situation to be delivered because it taught as the, the we get the conversation from the two of them like they really don't know jesus like that like they've heard about jesus they may have seen him in past they may have heard about his miracles but they don't know jesus like that but could it be that the the, the, the the it took crucifixion it took the worst day of his life to put him in the proper place to put him in an elevated place to speak to jesus to get to talk to jesus face to face because everybody else on the ground was looking up at jesus but he was right there on the side of Jesus, talking to him face to face. Could God give you a rough day just to be able for you to talk to Jesus face to face, to put you in a position where you can receive a miracle? Because when Jesus said today you would be, be in paradise, that today that he said in the Greek, it, 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 it doesn't say today, like five hours from now, today, 15 minutes from now. No, his today meant in the Greek, it means now. So he got the now from heaven to override the now condition that he was experiencing. His now condition on earth was he's being crucified. But his now condition in heaven was, now you will be with me in paradise. It was like, he, so God, God can be able to take you from your now that you're experiencing and to heaven's now. And heaven's now is far greater than anything. The Bible says, far greater is the glory that we will, we will receive. Far greater is, is the glory that we will have Go that, that any suffering, any persecution, any trial you will face. So as I leave you, remember this. Acknowledge even in your rough times, even in your hard times, that Jesus is still king. And don't despise the hard times, because sometimes God is using the hard times for you to see him and for you to see his face. And in those times, you must remember that God is still God and he is still king. As we sign off, oh man, thank you so much. Thank you so much, D'Angelo Wall, who, who reminded us, who reminded us about, you know, Father, forgive them. And that's, that's, that was such a good remi reminder about forgiveness. And I think all of us can all can think about something that we may possibly need to be saying, Father, I really need your help with forgiving with. Um, it's just a good reminder for all of us to get in proper posture with our hearts. Father, forgive them. One of the things that I love most about this time of the year when we reflect back on the things that he said 
is even though it was so much so far so long ago these things are so so applicable and stuff that we can take and make up and apply to our personal lives we can all think on something that we may be needing to go in and we may be saying oh father i'm i'm holding unforgiveness here so i need to for you to help me do it so the angel reminded of us reminded us of that and how unforgiveness can be holding and blocking what it is that the lord desires to do in our lives then brian came behind and he told us you know the, the difference in the two thieves and how one of the thief was just just made a choice just choose to say no matter what it is that you do that's one of those kind of things that god you know you know what's best so and you was king so in your kingdom when is your kingdom because he acknowledged him as lord and i think that was the thing acknowledging him as lord no matter what it is that he was going through so thank you so much guys for giving us those two shots that was very phenomenal we have tamisha cash she's coming and she's going to come and she's going to talk to us about mother here is your son mother behold your son and she's going to tell um john john behold your mother and she's going to help us to understand that a little bit better i know that's one of those things that a lot of people is feeling nervous about because they can't quite make sense of it but i believe that there's such a prophetic saying and meaning to it i believe that the lord has a whole lot saying on that so she's going to help us with that so we turn it over to tamisha cash good night and audrey i want to thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this moment and the scripture reads in john 19 verses 25 through 27 now there stood by the cross of jesus's mother and his mother's sister mary the wife of cleophas and mary magdalene when jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved he said unto his mother woman behold thy son then he said to him, then said he to the disciple behold thy mother and from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home from the very beginning of time and through the reading of the word, we see in the pages of the Bible that God created men and women to fulfill his purpose on the earth. Moses, God created to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. Joshua to lead the children of Israel across the Jordan River into the promised land. Rahab was given an assignment from God and a scarlet cord to conceal God's chosen spies. God created David to shepherd and be a warrior and a king to the children of Israel. Jeremiah was ordained a prophet unto the nations to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. Jonah was created to take the message of repentance to Nineveh. Anna spent her life interceding for the coming Messiah. John the Baptist was assigned to be a voice in the wilderness to prepare the way for Jesus. Mary was assigned to bring forth Christ in the earth. John was assigned to write letters to the church after the death of Christ. These persons were marked before birth to fulfill a purpose in the earth. Heaven's mark upon them validated their purpose long before they were created. And here in this chapter of scripture, Mary and John looked at the promised Messiah, beholding his death. And I could imagine Mary as the mother of Jesus, internalizing the prophetic word that she had received in Luke chapter one from the angel Gabriel. She was considered highly favored and blessed among women. She was told that she would bring forth a son and that he would be great called son of the highest that the Lord God would give him the throne of David, that he would reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom, there would be no end. And even the prophetic revelation spoken as she was greeted by Elizabeth in Luke 1, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Mary's song of praise in Luke 1 indicates that she believed the prophetic promise. She worshiped for the fulfillment of it. Her soul magnified the Lord and her spirit rejoiced in God. His, her savior. Here at this moment, her promise was nailed to a cross. He had no form of comeliness, no beauty that he should be desired, rejected, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, despised. He laid there bearing the grief and carrying the sorrows of humanity, afflicted, wounded, bruised, chastised and oppressed. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Blood poured from the, blood poured from the thorn bound to his head and the nails in his hands had stretched him wide and he was numbered with the transgressors. Hair laid Mary's promise, the death of her promise laid on the cross. This was not supposed to be. I could only imagine Mary saying, God, you gave me something good. I never asked for this. How is it now that you're taking it away from me? And Jesus, knowing Mary's thoughts, spoke to her, not identifying with her pain as a mother, the agony, the torment of her soul, but addressed her woman. And I believe when he said woman, he shifted her into her new assignment. He spoke into her future. He prophesied the new thing that was to come forth. He said, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. The word behold means...
agony. And the gaze with love upon John, her new son, her on the the cross. He was saying, see light. Even through, though I am dead, the death of me is the beginning of a new life for you and John. Observe something new occurring in this moment. This is the death of your first assignment, but the beginning of your new assignment. He was saying to Mary, your role of being a mother is more than biological. It's about your assignment to bring about the will of God in the earth. Circumstances would tell him to pick. He would need intercession to see beyond the natural into the spirit realm to see the things to come. Your role to me as a mother is dead, but you are still necessary. Those mother skills are still necessary in the earth. There is still work for you to do. There is still an assignment over your head. Your son may be dead, but here is your new son. Your promise may be dead, but here is your prophetic future as you did for me now do for John. To John, he was saying, I may not be here to walk with you, but I still have some things I need to reveal to you. I need you to behold the revelation that my blood cleanses from all sin. I need you to declare that God is light and in him is no darkness. I need you to remind them to know me is to keep my commandments. Let them know that for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the father, but is of the world. John, I need you to write the book of completion, write letters to the church. Let them see my plan for redemption and the prophetic events that will take place. Jesus' words spoke a prophetic destiny over Mary and John. Jesus' words brought in a new beginning, a new order in their life. And how many of you would believe the end of a thing is the beginning of something new? You must understand that your assignment on the earth is beyond you, beyond your comfort, beyond who you are. What seems as a dead situation is bringing forth something new in the earth. Isaiah 55 says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. God is a God of purpose. The way he chooses to manifest himself is totally up to his sovereignty. From the cross, Jesus established a new assignment. Every fiber of our being is designed and knitted together to accommodate God's purpose for our life. And just as Jesus secured Mary and John's future, you are secured by the hands of God. He, his love secures you. His sovereignty secures you. His faithfulness and mercy secures you. Life events can make us question our existence, question our identity, even question if God is present. Why are these things happening? His word to you today is the same word over 2,000 plus years ago. And from Ecclesiastes 3, it states to everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down. And a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rent, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. What profit has he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? Many anticipated a new decade that would bring forth new blessings, new opportunities, a new season of great things. We declared that 2020 was our year for failure, for breakthrough, for all things new. And in spite of the time and season, we find ourselves know that this season in your life is not a mistake. Even at the worst time, when life looks dark and gloomy, when we feel like we are facing a dead end. Rest in knowing that God has you secured in his hands. He has your promise secured in his hands. He has your prophetic word secured in your hands. God sanctioned your life before you were born. And God does not practice trial and error. His sovereign nature covers you from beginning to end, end to beginning as you walk on this earth. You are validated for the trials. You are validated for the tests. You are validated for the tribulations. And you have also been validated for the glory. Now, no, we have not come by this way, no, we have not come this way, but God Almighty holds the power to bring us to it. And even as Jesus shifted Mary and John through the words he declared out of his mouth, God is saying we will shift our lives through the decree of the prophetic word. God is saying, behold your future. Behold your assignment. Behold the new thing. And in order for you to behold the new, your eyes need to be enlightened. You need to shift your gaze from the dead things 
stop repeating the decrees of this world because as a born again believer, you are in the world, but not of the world. As you prophesy over your family, your household, your community, your nation, you are establishing the will of God in the earth. You are called to speak life more than the news reporters can speak death. You are called to speak financial shift more than the world is speaking a recession. Let the word of God govern your atmosphere. And this is the season to behold your future. See the see with the eyes of faith who God has called you to be and what he has called you to do in the earth. God is raising up some new voices in the her, in the earth with pure hearts to sound the alarm of heaven to bring realignment into the body of Christ where our gaze has been shifted from our assignment. God is calling us to focus on heaven's agenda. The call of God is for greater than the call of man. And so right now, I decree and declare that there is a shift in your perspective. tormenting thought and whatever your dark situation is that you gain the revelation that death is beginning that shall bring forth glory that you would position yourself to have heaven's agenda for your life and those who he has called you to in this hour and I bring the spirit of fear from off of your life. And I decree and declare that you will arise to the call of God upon your life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And so I... Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Behold. Yahweh will do a new thing and it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? He will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And finally, the Lord of hosts has sworn saying, surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. People of God, God is saying, behold your future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamisha. My God, awesome word, my awesome God, word. thank you so much for that. Listen, I think all of us can now start to think about something that we need to be, need to refocus. And it's just a perfect reminder of the time that we're in. Heaven has not changed his mind concerning what is already said. Heaven has not changed his mind. The promise is still sure. Yeah. The promise is still sure. That does not change because of COVID-19. I don't care who it is. I don't care what it is. The promise is still sure. And it's a, it's a good reminder that if he said and he shall do it and he shall make it good and he shall bring it to pass that that promise woman be all your son son be all your mother the, the, listen that's the promise so remember that promise that thing that the lord has said unto you and i'm one of the preachers so i can call on you know preacher proclaimers declare us so i'm going to call the next two coming up next we have john Carley, and he's coming and his his saying is eli eli lama sabathani which is my god my god why has thou forsaken me Following him is Master Cameron Roll, and he is coming with eyes thirst. So we want to give them an opportunity to share what it is that the Lord has laid on their heart concerning these, these two topics. And we're going to call in now Master Donnie Colley. Is you, sir. Hey, good night. Good night. So I, I may not be one of the preachers either, <laughs> but I, I, I've come just for a short time just to possibly mess up your theology like my, my theology was messed up as I was studying this, this passage of scripture, this text. So Matthew, Matthew 27 from verse 25, and I'm gonna go up until, I'm gonna go up until verse 49. And it says that from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. And then it says, from about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And that is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, fixed it on a reed and offered him a drink. But the rest said, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. So traditionally, we have been taught that this scripture, this reference was about God turning his back on Jesus because, of course, we know Jesus became sin so that he could take on the punishment, the rightful, the just punishment for sin, which is death. And he did that on our behalf. 
So sorry, give me one second. Yes. So the right the rightful and just punishment for sin was death. I okay, I hope everybody can hear me all right. I think somebody is saying that they can't hear. But this scripture is not about God turning his back on Jesus. As a matter of fact, I don't think God turned his back on Jesus at all. I don't think he did that. And if it was so much so that God hated sin to the extent that he could not look upon it, then why would he have handled Adam and Eve the way he did when sin entered the world? And I, I in studying the parallel for this, this same scripture reference was Psalm 22. Psalm 22 opens with this same proclamation or this same exclamation. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I read that and it did not click right away that maybe there was something different. There was a different perspective. Maybe there was a, another idea other than the one that we have been accustomed to, the one that we've been taught that God turned his back on Jesus at the time he was on the cross and made this exclamation. So what actually happened was Psalm 22, and we know a lot of the Psalms or quite a number of the Psalms were actually prophetic. And so Psalm 22 was actually one of those prophetic Psalms where David was having a moment where he was seeing into the future and talking about the Messiah. It's a messianic prophecy. If you read Psalm 22, and I don't have the time to read it now, so you're going to have to read it yourself. But if you read Psalm 22, you see where it describes almost to, a, to, a, to a, an exact detail the suffering that Jesus experienced. And it opened with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you continue near the end of the, the Psalm, it lets us know that God actually didn't forsake Jesus, but... His plan, his intention was to exalt Jesus and give him, you know, give him rulership over the earth and rulership over all, making him Lord of all and making him king of kings. And then we, we look at Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 is the same thing. It's a messianic prophecy by, by the prophet Isaiah. And again, near the end of that, that chapter or that, that, that portion of scripture, that text, it, it tells us that, you know, Jesus became like the rebels, but... He bought, you know, he bought the sin and the punishment for, of the rebels, but God's desire was to exalt him and make him Lord. So here it is. This messed me up. <laughs> this scripture was not about God turning his back on Jesus, but it was the fulfillment of prophecy. And what happened was those who were there, the bystanders, the onlookers, they missed it, and they likely missed it because the religious league didn't. They didn't. They didn't get it. They missed it, and so they didn't teach it. But if they had known better, if they were paying attention, they would have remembered that that David, in the writings of Scripture, talked about this exact same thing. Talked about Jesus, and God's desire to make Him Lord, and saying that God didn't desire or or didn't want to reject him or turn away from him in that moment. And again, I mentioned Adam and Eve in the very beginning. Instead of seeing the sin and turning away from it, God went looking for Adam and Eve when they sinned. He went looking for them. And as a matter of fact, he gave them, he gave them hope. Even though he was punishing them, even though he was you know, telling them, listen, sin has to be punished. And, and these, these are the consequences of your wrongdoing. He still said to them, there is hope because one day I'm going to redeem you. And that redemption came by way of Jesus Christ. So they missed it. They missed it in that day. And the expositors of today, they missed it. And I, I asked myself the question, why did they miss it? Why did they miss it? And so I, I came up with a few things, a few reasons that may possibly be why they missed it. One is deception. Deception. We're living in a time of deception. There are lots 
of, of voices out there. There's lots of information. There's information overload. So it's easy in this time to be deceived. And then there's familiarity. And that kind of familiarity that when you hear something over and over again, you start to believe it. It starts to become true to you. And so you don't take any time to go ahead and find out, is this really true? And then that familiarity breeds the third thing, complacency. We, 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 we get settled in, in what it is we've heard and seen and, 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 and the, you know, the things that we've known traditionally. We, we get settled in those things and we become relaxed. So we're no longer pursuing like we should. We're no longer studying like we should. So we miss it for those three reasons, deception, familiarity, and complacency. So here's another question. What do we do to avoid falling into these three dispositions? Deception, familiarity, and complacency. I say that we ought to become like the Bereans. And if you do not know, the Bereans were a set of people that Paul and Silas preached to. And they were preaching to them about Jesus Christ, telling them what they've been taught by Jesus and what they've discovered and, you know, what rima they've been given and things that they, they knew by, by way of their study of the word. But the Bereans did something. They fact-checked. The Bible tells us that they would go away. And whenever Paul and Silas preached or teach them, taught them something, they would go away and they would search the scriptures to make sure that what they heard was what was actually supposed to be understood. It was actually what God intended for them to know. And they, they, they wanted to know whether or not it was real truth. So we ought to be like the Bereans in this time. We got to wade through all these voices and all this, these different ideologies and all these different philosophies and go back to go back to scripture, go back to the word of God and fact check and find out if what it is we, we're hearing and seeing and the things that are being said, if, if it is real truth, because we need the truth. The Bible tells us that we ought to study to show ourselves approved, to be workers who are not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we got to fact check like the Bereans. Then the second thing is, or, or, or the, the last thing, finally, we ought to nurture a, nurture a relationship with God. We ought to nurture a relationship with God. There is scripture that tells us that we ought not that man teach us. We don't need men to teach us. Now, that, that's, that's a whole other story. That's a whole different kettle of fish. And maybe sometime later, if I had time, or if I get time sometime later, I'll probably get into that. But we ought to nurture a relationship with God. Because let me tell you, the closer we get to him, the more we see, the more we understand, the more he divinely opens up our understanding, the more knowledge we gain, the more things that we will know. And we have Holy Spirit to show us, to help us to understand, to make us know things. So three things that we ought to avoid, and I'm going to leave those things with you. As we ought to avoid being deceived in this time. And we know that the, the, the spirit of deception is here. We ought to avoid becoming familiar. We ought to not allow familiarity to cause us to become complacent about our relationship with God, about getting to know God. And it is important in this time, it is important in this time that we know him, that we know him, that we know him. We, not, we ought not to be complacent. Don't be deceived, don't become familiar, and don't be complacent. So again, how do we avoid those three things? We fact check, one, we study, and, and thirdly and finally, we nurture our relationship with God. We draw nigh to him and he draws nigh to us. And I hope that blessed somebody and I hope it messed up your theology like it messed up mine. All right. Um, everybody should be able to uh, to hear me. Uh, very briefly, I am just, the scripture that I'm talking from, it is John 19 verses 28. Um, and the scripture says to us, um, after this, um, after this, Jesus knowing that all things had happened, uh, that all things had already happened, had, had already, excuse me, being accomplished to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am 
thirsty. Um, and so today, uh, just for a few seconds, because you know, um, once I get stirred, it's kind of hard for me to climb down off of this horse. Um, but but just briefly, uh, I just want to talk to you from uh, that particular passage, that particular scripture, uh, that one of the sayings that Jesus said on the cross, and that saying is that I am thirsty. Now, it's very easy for you to read the scripture. It's very easy for you to begin to look at the scripture and to think that the place from which uh, 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 Christ was talking from was from an earthly realm. It's very easy for many of us sometimes to read that scripture, I am thirsty. Um, and, and, and think that Christ literally, he was talking about a natural thirst. Um, but the reality was he was never talking about a natural thirst. And a lot of, and they did not understood that those who were persecuting him. How do I know this? Because the Bible said to us, um, when, when, when Christ walked on the earth, he said to us, he said that, um, sorry, he said to us that my meat is to do the will of the Father that sent me. I want to go back again. My meat is to do the will of the Father that sent me. So which made me understand that Christ, he was never talking about a natural, he's never talking about a natural thirst. And here's a reality. God's on a cross. Let's, let's take a look at it. God is on a cross, right? He is up there. He is nailed to our cross. The God that has the power to come down off a cross. Do you think that the first thing that he's going to say is, I am thirsty? If he's naturally thirsty, the God that has the power to call legions of angels from heaven. Do you really think that the first thing that he's going to say uh, uh, when he gets time to speak is, I am thirsty? Which lets me know that God was not talking about an earth thirst. He was not talking about a natural thirst. He was not talking about a mortal thirst. The thirst that Christ was talking about while he was on the cross was he was talking about a spiritual thirst. He had fulfilled something and so now it was time for him uh, 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 to go to another realm and go to another dimension that he's never seen before. What am I saying to you? The cry of every believer, the cry of every Christian should always be that I am thirsty. And whenever there is an absence of thirst, there will always be an absence of power. And I came to tell you just for a few seconds that the next move of God that's coming to the earth, the next move of revival and reformation that's coming to the earth, it's not coming for the gifted. Uh, the next move or the next crew of people that God's bringing on in this next dispensation is not a group of prophetic people that know how to prophesy. It is not a group of prophetic people that know how to uh, how to work miracles but the next group of people that God is oh I feel the presence of God the next group of people that God is about to breathe on is a people that has the language of I am thirsty and when Christ was on the cross and he said to his and he said to his disciples that I am thirsty what he really what he really meant okay so my parents are telling me I'm a little bit too loud in the house pray for me um but that's okay uh what he really meant was he meant that I have completed my work in this earthly realm so much so that now my desire and my thirst and my appetite is for something supernatural I want to say to you that in order for you to be are uh, the very person that God has called you to be in this next season. In order for you to begin to understand uh, the move of revival and reformation that is coming in this next season, your language and your cry should always be, I thirst. And whenever your cry is absent of a of thirst, whenever your appetite is one that is not thirsty and one that is not hungry, or whenever you find yourself, let me correct myself, whenever you find yourself in a place where you are not hungry and you are not thirsty, it is an absolute indication that you are not ready for the next realm. You are not ready for the next season. You are not ready for the next move of God. And I want to say to you that many persons, I need you to understand that uh, uh, Matthew 5 and 6 says, us that they that hunger I need to whew, I'm getting stirred but it says to us that they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled 
which lets me know that the only way for you to be filled is if you stay thirsty. The only way for you to be filled is if you stay hungry. The only way for you to be filled is if you stay in pursuit of the presence of God. And when Christ was on the cross and he had the power, he had the um, he had the grace, he had the, the authority to take himself off of the cross. His cry was a cry that represented that this particular place that I am in in, that this particular space that I am in physically, this is a space that cannot uh, fulfill what it is that I have to do. That this particular space that I am in, that this particular space cannot satisfy the hungers of my soul, that this particular space that I am in, that this space cannot uh, give me uh, a water uh, uh, to, to satisfy my thirst. What am I saying to you? And I'm about to close already. Would you guys believe it? Yes, I'm about to conclude. But what I want to say to you is that the next move of God that is coming to the Bahamas, for many of you that is in the U.S., the next move of God that is coming to the United States, it is coming through a cry of people that is thirsty. I know you're anointed. I know you know how to speak in tongues. I know how you can prophesy. I know I know how well you can work in miracles. But I am of the persuasion that in the next season, that the movements and the hands of God and the breath of God is about to, oh, precious Jesus, calm me down. It is about to blow over a people that is hungry. My question to you is what is it that you're hungry for? What is it that you're thirsty for? Because whenever a believer is absent of thirst, they are present with carnality. Wherever there's an absence of thirst, there is a presence of carnality. There is an awareness of carnality because the reality is to us that God said to us, yes, that I will pour my spirit upon you. Your sons and your daughters will begin to prophesy. But a lot of persons don't know that the ushering of the pouring of God is going to come is going to come through a thirst. It's going to come through a cry. So I've just come for two seconds just to kind of set you free and kind of deliver you where your appetites have been divided, where you have been thirsty for carnal stuff, where you have been hungry for earthly stuff, where you have been craving for the natural stuff. In this next season, in this next move, the hands and the breath of God, my God, the hands and the breath of God is breathing over a people that is hungry. And so let us pray. Father, I thank you that many persons that are represented on this call in the next few days that there will be a resurrection. Oh, yes, sir. Lord, even as you resurrected from the grave, let there be a resurrection of thirst and hunger that will shift them into the right realm, that will shift them into the right dispensation. And Father, even now, I declare, yes, Father, that you will begin to rest a glory we upon the God, they will not be able uh, to, 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 they will not be able uh, to be satisfied with what is carnal. They will not be satisfied with what is natural. And Father, even when you fill us up, and even Father, when you begin to do a hungry, uh, when you open a hunger in our spirits, I pray, God, that we will be a people that we will never be satisfied. And so, Father, even now, I pray that you would awaken even now. I declare that everybody represented on this call, everybody that is represented on this live, where they have lost their thirst. And where they have lost, where they have lost their thirst, where they have lost their appetite, where they have become carnal. Father, I pray and I decree even now that you will begin to awaken a thirst in them. I declare even now that you're doing a supernatural thing, even in their appetite, where, Father God, that they will desire their spiritual food more than their natural food. And so, God. God, even now I declare over this life that you will begin to pour a measure of hunger. Yes, Lord, that you will begin to, oh, that you will begin to pour a measure of thirst. And may we never lose our hunger. May we never lose our thirst. May we never lose our appetite. And God, even when we cry for more and you too fill us up, make us hungry again. God, we will not be a people that is satisfied. Oh, precious Jesus. Thank <laughs> you.
that is satisfied by the amount of glory we've received. We will not be a people that is satisfied by the amount of anointing we've received. We will not be a people that is satisfied by how much miracles we can perform. But Father God, in this next move, in this next dispensation, may you distinguish and mark us by the hunger and the thirst of God. And so now, Father, may thirst begin to arise. Come on, come on, press into that for just a second. May thirst begin to arise. I declare even now that you will begin to open a portal. I declare, God, even now that you begin to open a I declare that the glory of God is beginning to ascend and descend in rooms even now, and that you would begin to awaken, oh my God, that you would begin to awaken in us a hunger and a thirst for your righteousness. That when we begin to watch Netflix, even even in certain moments, you would come and you would awaken a thirst and a hunger for us. And so even now, may thirst, may thirst come alive. Handele Bay. Let us come alive. And I declare that the declaration of Jesus Christ will begin to ring in our atmosphere. May it begin to echo in our ears. I'm thirsty. Father God, when our flesh begins to kick in, let it be. I'm thirsty for the things of the Spirit. When we begin to desire the things of this earth, let it be. I am thirsty for the things of the Spirit. And so even now, awaken. Awaken. Awaken thirst, awaken it, awaken it. I command your passions to come alive. I command your appetites to come alive. I command even now by way of the spirit and by virtue of the spirit that your hunger and your thirst would become acquainted with the God realm, would become acquainted with the supernatural realm. I declare that where your appetites are being divided, oh yes, Lord, I thank you that where your appetites are being divided, that this day, that this moment, that there is a revival that begins to break out into the depths of your soul that there is a revival oh my god spring up a well of thirst yes god spring up a well of hunger and i'm so sorry but god bless you god keep you and i thank you father we thank you god we thank you father Father, drive us by our by your thirst, there, Father God. Yes, by our thirst for you, Father. Motivate us, direct us even now, Father. Jesus. Father, and we thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. So even as we do the next move is for with, with made the thirsty ones. If you and we know that you're thirsty for more, so we got some more coming for you. We got Sister Gilberta Thompson, and she's coming with it. It's finished. And all the way from across the waters, my brother, Lois Wimbley from Chicago. He's coming with, in, Father, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. Receive them. All right, sorry, one second. We're gonna we have she having a little a little volume issue. So we're gonna get that volume sorted out. We'll get in contact with her right now. We're gonna get her, her mic sorted out so we can hear her because I definitely know without a shadow of a doubt that she has something to say regarding it is finished. It is finished. That's one of my favorite sayings. It is finished. It is finished. And I believe camera left, left us very charged. It gave us a great reminder of our thirst. We need to be thirsty and, and our purpose for being thirsty and what are we thirsty for? So this is a good, good reminder for us with all of that. And I think she should be ready and good now. Brother, can you hear us? Can I hear you?
You can hear us? We can't hear you. All right, let's, we want to give a few moments. Hallelujah. It is finished. It is yeah, finished. Can't hear you. No, ma'am, can't hear you. Okay, while she sorts that out, we're going to allow our friend and brother, Brother Wimbley, to go on. All right, so we're going to switch it up, and we're going to drop him in here. <laughs> All right. All right. Lord, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And we get, we get, it is finished after this. Well, you said we've been doing a bit unorthodox. Yeah, we're unorthodox. I mean, that's just how we work anyway. So thank you so much, sir. So we pass it on to you now. All right. No problem. Can you all hear me good? I hope everything is well. Let me first say to the Baines, I love you. I honor you. I appreciate what and who you are to the body of Christ. Let's dig into this. Um, and Jesus said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And the next verse says, with these words, he breathed his last breath. And we know that this is the uh, last few moments uh, where Jesus is actually uh, committing his spirit. He is preparing himself to die. Uh, but I don't want to spend too much time focusing just on the death of Christ. I want to talk to you what took place in the death of Christ, because he has three days uh, to unravel and un, uh, un, unrestrict every cord, every demonic yoke, every principality, every generational curse, the poverty that's on your grandmother's line, the sickness that was on your father's line. Within three days, Jesus stripped hell of its power over your family. And I want to talk to you from this subject, the war of the gifted, the war of the gifted. Let me tie this in. And this is what the Holy Spirit is giving me because he says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Now, here's why that's so significant, because Jesus said that if I do not depart, the comforter cannot come. All right. If I do not depart, the comforter cannot come. I have to go so that the comforter can come. The word comforter there is the Greek word parakletos. It is what we get the word paraclete. It's like a it's it's a it's a the, the, the one of the half of the words or the first derivative of the word is the word para. It's almost like a legal representation. It's almost like a legal attorney. So Jesus says that if I do not come, then the attorney, the paraclete, your your legal representation in the earth cannot come. So when Jesus said, Father, I commit into your hands, I commit my spirit, it gave Holy Spirit immediate access to step into the earth realm and release something into the earth. And here's what happened. When Jesus said, into, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number four, is it says this, that when he ascended on, uh, on high, he also descended. It says that when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. All right. One translation says that he led captivity captive. He led the captives away and he gave gifts to his people. So number one, when Jesus enters into to his final moments when he says I'm committing my, my hands into your spirit he says in these words he gave he breathed his last breath immediately right there the Holy Spirit was released number one but number two he led captivity captive so you don't have to worry about the enemy trying to hold you captive because he's been stripped of his authority he was stripped of his office he was stripped of his legal power because the paraclete showed up and when the paraclete showed up he gave legal access he was our legal, he is our legal representation in the earth realm. The Holy Spirit defends you while you were sleeping. The Holy Spirit was defending you while you were in your mess. The Holy Spirit was defending with defending you when you didn't know who you were. The Holy Spirit was defending you when you lost your idea and uh, lost your gift and lost your, your sense of awareness. The Holy Spirit was defending you when you were in false covenant with people that didn't mean you know well. The Holy Spirit was defending 
defending you, my goodness. And the reason why God, the Holy Spirit was defending you was because he placed something in you. Remember, it says this, this is why the scripture says when he ascended to the heights or to the highest place, he led the crowds or he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. And here is where we are. We are in between understanding what God has already done and embracing what God has done in you. And you're going to come through a warfare. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to war for what God placed in you because the enemy wants to make you believe that what he has is greater than what God has. But Jesus said, he said, in your hands, I come Commit my spirit and he breathed his last words. And this is what the Holy Spirit is getting ready to do in your life. The Holy Spirit is going to give you your breath again. The Holy Spirit is going to let you feel like you're breathing again. I just declare over every gifted leader, over every entrepreneur, over every church leader, over every ministry leader, over every father, every apostolic gift, every spiritual mother. I prophesy the wind of God will fill your spirit. You're getting ready to breathe again. You're getting ready to breathe again. You've been under so much pressure. You've been in, under so much stress, so much anxiety. You've been feeling like the walls are caving in. But man, woman of God, the Lord says, he says, I'm letting you breathe. The Lord says you will not die in this. You're going to breathe again. And here's why. Revelation chapter number one, verse number 18 says, I am the living one. I was dead and now I am alive for ever and ever. And he says, and I hold in my hand the keys to death, to hell and the grave. In other words, the enemy can no longer have access to throw what's in you in the grave because Jesus took the keys from hell. Jesus took the keys from Satan. Jesus took the keys of death and the grave. So I like to jokingly say this, that Satan, that the devil doesn't even have keys to his own home. The enemy doesn't even have access to his own home. He doesn't, he can't even get through the front door because in order for him to get to the, in order for him to get the keys back, he got to wrestle with God and God took the keys. Jesus took the keys. He said, behold, I am the living one. I was dead, but now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and hell in my hand. So you don't have to fear hell because Jesus took the keys from hell. Mm. You don't have to fear death because Jesus took the keys from death. And if death wanted the keys back, death has to fight with God. If hell wanted the keys back, hell has to fight with God. And if Lucifer wanted the keys back, Lucifer has to fight with God because they thought they killed Jesus, but what they did not know was he that descended also ascended and he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. My friend, there's something in you that's greater than the pressure that's around you. There's something in you that was purchased in blood. There's something in you that was purchased with, with tears. There's something in you that he had to be beaten for. There's something in you that he had to be pierced for. And I refuse to allow hell and I refuse to allow the enemy to strip what God paid for because if he's going to try to take from me what God gave me, he got to wrestle with God. Mm. I declare over you that your strength is coming back. I declare over you, your tenacity is coming back. I declare over you, you're going to walk in confidence this year. I declare over you that you're going to stand strong in the zeal of the Lord and you're going to be full of faith, full of courage, full of hope. And you're going to begin to look yourself in the eye and prophesy that you will live and you will not die is the word of the Lord over your life. And this is where we are. Jesus has given us grace and he's lo loose the Holy Holy Spirit in the earth. And so this next move of God, we're getting ready to see not just the saints being filled with the Holy Spirit, but some teachers. I I, I had a dream and I'm going to share this and I'm going to wrap this up. I had an open dream where I saw a revival of kids ministry. It was like kids were leading teachers in baptism in the Holy Ghost. And I prophesied that the education sectors of the Bahamas, the education sectors of America are getting ready to meet the most powerful spirit filled kids. And while they're in the middle of recess, teachers are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I loosen it now, even in the mighty name of Jesus, that we're getting ready to see the revival that we've been prophesying and that we've been believing God for may not come in the church. We're getting ready to see leaders and civic leaders and political leaders and governmental leaders be impacted by the Holy Spirit like never before. And this is what God is doing. So the scripture says this, 
in Romans chapter number six, verse number five, it says, for if we have been uni united with him like this in his death, it says that we shall reign with him or be united with him in his resurrection and in his power. So when Christ was, when Christ was crucified, we were crucified. Mm. When Christ was when Christ was crucified, we were crucified. When Christ died, we died. But when he rose, when Christ rose, everything in you rose. And so you are the righteousness of God. You are the resurrection of God. You are not dead in trespasses anymore. You're not an alien. You're not outside the family. My friend, you have access to the throne. My friend, you're not some orphan. My friend, you're a son and daughter of the most high and you have access because the scripture tells us for if we have been united with him in death like his, so we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. So the same way he died and rose is the same way we will as well. There's something in you that's trying to rise, but you're going to have to learn there is a war for the gift. There's a war for the gifting. There's a war on the inside that's trying to suffocate the things of God, suffocate the word of the Lord. And I loose it over you that God is going to give you strength to war. God is going to give you strength to embrace what he gave you. Remember, if hell tries to take it from you, they have to wrestle with God. If hell Hell tries to strip it from you. They have to fight with God. I declare over you that the gift, the grace of God is going to lift in your life and Christ will be elevated in your life and people will see that you've been, you've been resurrected. You're not the same person. You're not the same person from the block. You've been resurrected. Father, I declare over your people. I declare over your people that yes, you have come, you have come to fill their hearts, you have come to fill them with Holy Spirit, but Holy Spirit, I thank you that your word says that you gave gifts, Holy Spirit, I thank you for gifts, let the gift of God rise, I declare even now that no one will suffocate, I declare even now that no one will drown in uncertainty and in anxiety, I declare even now to every person that is watching, to every person that's uncertain, I declare even now that you will live, you will breathe, and you will breathe again in your journey and the Holy Spirit is saying that the gifts of the gifts are getting ready to live again. I see you getting a shovel and digging that gift out of the grave. I see you getting a shovel and digging out what you threw away. The Father is not going to give you a new word. The Father is going to give you the strength to pull out the old word because many of you were talked out of what God did. Many of you were talked out of what God promised you because you trusted someone more than you trusted Holy Spirit and you gave them greater access to your journey than Holy Spirit. And when they said you couldn't do it, you buried it. But God said, who told you to throw that away? <laughs> the Lord says, who told you to throw it away? He says, daughter, go pick it back up again. Son, go dig that thing out of the grave. He says, mother, I want you to go pick that intercession back up. Father, go pick that courage back up. Who told you to throw this thing away? Who told you to bury my, your dreams? Who told you to bury prophecy and bury the apostolic and bury dream interpretation and bury your dance and ministry? I loose over you the courage to dig this thing out. You're going to dig this thing out with strength. If you got to cry doing it, you're going to do it. If you got to do it by yourself, you're going to do it. If you got to do it while people are laughing at you, you're going to do it. If you got to do it with no money in your pocket, you're going to do it. If you got to do it sick in your body, you're going to dig this thing out. You will live because if you were united with him in his death and in his re resurrection, we shall be united with him the same way. I declare over you, I declare over you that your warfare has ended. The gifts of God are coming out of you alive in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Bless you. Thank you so much to my friends, the Baines. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I pray that you all were strengthened and encouraged. Mm -hmm. All right. As we're still waiting for Gilbert to get, to get together, um, Lois, I'd ask you a favor, and I'd ask yes. you who's still on this live a favor. Um, when we were, there was a press conference earlier this week, and one of our executives at, at our Ministry of Health was talking, they were projecting, we projected numbers, and they were projecting 90, to having 90 cases of, of, of COVID by this Sunday. Mm. That's one of their projections. Now, I understand, you know, Science, I understand it's caution. I understand, you know, that they, they, they're trying to 
you know, to have projections and models together. But we projected by the blood of the Lamb yeah. and the blood of Jesus that that that, that this 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 plague will stay, that this will stop. Yes. And yes. I ask you to, to lead off in the session as yes. all of us are playing along, everyone who's on this live, to plead the blood of Jesus over this Bahama land and yes. even over the city in Chicago. Yes, yes, yes. Father, we thank you. We give you all praise, glory, and honor. We, we declare praise. that your word has lifted above sickness and disease. We loose the promises of God. We loose the shed blood of the Lamb. And we declare even now that sickness and disease will not come now. I dwell in. So your word tells us that I sit my word and my word heal. Father, I pray even now, Lord Jesus, that the report of the enemy will not prosper. For you said in your word, who shall believe the report of the Lord? We prophesy, God, that thank you the of the Lord will be exalted above the hand of the enemy. We yes, prophesy, uh, God, yes. that Babylonian thinking and Babylonian systems and demonic systems will not take root in Nassau, will not take root in Freeport. We prophesy Name to the Jesus. islands and we declare that the blood of the Lamb has been loosed over the islands. And God, what the enemy said would happen. Father, I thank you that you're the God of the turnaround. And so, Father, we pray even now that there'll be no sick nor feeble among you. For your word says that by your stripes we were healed and we declare it even now in the name of Jesus that there's no fear. We're not summoning this thing in our yes. home. We're not thinking that this is what's going to hit our home. Our homes are covered under the blood. Our yes. children are covered under the blood. Our name children are covered under the blood. When we Jesus. go to and four, we're covered under the blood. Your word says that angels encamped around those that fear them as a father. I thank you that we're surrounded. We're like a walking city. We're like a yes. walking city with, with armed guards in the spirit. Father, I declare even mm. now that the healing protection of God, it will not be as what the enemy has said. It will not be what the political people have said. But Father, we thank you that you reign supreme. We thank you that your word is forever settled. Oh, Lord, your word is forever settled. Father, we thank declare you. even now that your word has declared that we are already healed. And God, this curse, this 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 pandemic, Father, is breaking. It's losing its power. Father, yes, it's, losing its power. Jesus. it's losing its authority. It's losing its really? strength. The church is thank waking you. up. The sons and daughters are waking up to our yes, power. Yes. And together, we declare even now that Corona, COVID-19, Father, you have to break it. It's need to the name Jesus, and we yes. declare it so in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you. We give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we yes, declare Lord. even now that the same way that the plague was stopped when David offered sacrifice, we declare that even now as we've offered the sacrifice of praise, as we've offered the sacrifice of our time and worship and adoration and prayer to you, God, that the plague be stayed, Father, that it be stopped in its tracks right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, God. Bye bye. Uh, hold on now. Thank you, sir. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So yes, right Lord. now we're gonna see if we can get Sister Gilberta in. And if not, then she'll just do it as a devotion or as a short video on the Facebook site. Thank, thank you so you. much, Lord. Love, Love you, bro. Love you. Hey, all right. Good night, everybody. Can you guys hear me now? Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Okay. Awesome. I had to switch devices, but in the end, it worked out. It worked out. Okay, so my saying is the sixth saying, which is it is finished. Um, but tonight it'll be the seventh saying. This is our last saying for tonight. And let me just go to the text right quick. It's John 19, verse 30. And it says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And I love to talk about the finished work of the cross. I love this time of year because in retrospect, the finished work of the cross is so beautiful. This was when, you know, we got the sealing of man's redemption. We know that from one man's disobedience, the world, um, sin came into the world, but from one man's obedience, this is Jesus. Now we have power over sin. We have power um, that was given to us through Jesus Christ. So the finished work of the cross is just so beautiful. It's such a beautiful story that we are now reconciled back to God. But on the cross, Jesus said that it is finished. 
And that passage can say so many things. It can mean so many things. There are so many things we can pull from that. But one thing that I would want to elaborate on tonight was when Jesus said it was finished, he was talking about his mission. He was talking about his purpose, his assignment here on this earth. And Jesus saying it was finished means that Jesus knew what his assignment was. He knew what his mission was. So for example, if I was a runner, which I'm not, if I had never run a 400 meter dash, or I have never seen a 400 meter racetrack, I would not know what that finish line looked like. I would not be able to identify that this 400, this course is 400 meters. And when I reached the finish line, I wouldn't know if it was 200 meters, 100 meters, 300 meters. But if I was familiar with the course, if I knew the racetrack, if I saw the racetrack, if I saw my race, I would know that I was at the finish line. So this tells us when Jesus said it is finished and he gave up the ghost, he knew exactly what his mission was here on earth. And we know that God's mission, although he healed the sick, although he gave, although he discipled, ultimately God's desire was so that man could be reconciled back to God so that now we can access God directly. And even in preparing this, preparing this I just felt, felt led to say it is finished, but our work continues. Yes, it is finished. Yes, Jesus's mission is here on earth is finished, but God's heart for humanity hasn't changed. God still has a heart for the lost. God still has a heart for the sinner. And ultimately, this is God's heart towards his people. So I just wanted to challenge the church. I wanted to challenge the saints to remember the mission, the mission that Christ started. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit. Yes, we have the paracletos and he's residing within us. He's giving, he's given us gifts. He's given us a assignments and purposes and so many things that we want to do in the earth. But ultimately, the heart of God is towards sinners. So in this season and during this time, how are we reaching out to our neighbors? How are we reaching out to those around us? How are we spreading the good news? Now we are in a time where bad news is everywhere. It's prevalent. But how are we now sharing the good news, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ? So yes, I know that you are sick. Yes, I know that you are in a financial slump. I know that you are in a situation that you cannot see your way out. But I know someone. I know a God. I know Jesus. I know him and he can heal you. He can help you. He can revive you. He can take you out of every pit and every dark place. So though we know that it is finished, that Jesus has left the earth, his earthly assignment is finished. We also know that the He it is finished so that we can continue. I know the disciples, they said, well, you know, they wanted Jesus to stay, but Jesus said, no, it's better if I leave because if I leave, the greater one is coming. The Holy Spirit is coming to empower us. As a church, we've been crying for revival. We've been crying for signs. We've been crying, oh God, send your signs. Lord, we want to heal the sick. We want to raise the dead. But the signs are for unbelievers so that they will know that God is here, that God is real, that God exists, that there is a God that can save them, that there is eternity after this, that there is a perspective beyond this world. So during this time, I just want to challenge the church. I want to challenge challenge everyone that's watching this video. Yeah, we're going to fry our fish and eat our hot cross buns, but let's not forget the reason he came. And the reason he came was so that humanity can be reconciled to him. Let's not lose our sensitivity. Let's not forget that the mission of God, the mission of the good news, the mission of the gospel is so that every soul, so that the lost will see and know that God will leave the 99 for the one so that we can be reconciled to him. Thank you, guys. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And as we conclude tonight, we just wanted to bring you the conversations from the cross, the words from the cross. We wanted you to, 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 to just uh, for us to now have our focus on the cross and what, it, what took place on there. And, uh, and there's going to be a lot of lives, a lot of, we can't meet physically in churches tomorrow. There's going to be a lot of lives. There's going to be a lot of, um, you know, places that you can interact with. And I, and I would ask you, I plead with you, find one of them that, that's comfortable for you, that you would like, that you would enjoy, and let's commemorate the cross. I know it's a vacation. I know it's a kind of a, stay, a staycation, stay home vacation, but let's commemorate the cross. Yeah. Um, COVID-19. Corona, whatever the name or its name is, it's not it's not the focus that we should have. The yes. focus that we should have is the cross. 
So let's make the cross our focus yeah. this weekend. Yeah. Let's be home and let's hear from God and let's, let's enjoy each other, enjoy our family. And let's look and let's reminisce and talk about the cross and the resurrection and the blood of Jesus that bought our salvation, that, 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 that assured our salvation. So as we conclude tonight, we thank you all for coming on um, and being such good, good viewers. Um, if you would like, if you'd like any more of the content, this kind of content, be sure to like the page, be sure to share the video as well. And um, check us in the mornings. We're doing devotions in the mornings. Uh, we won't be doing any this Saturday, this tomorrow. We won't be doing any tomorrow. We'll be having one Saturday and Monday. Yes, we Friday and Sunday, we, we let that for the church lives and stuff because everyone will have their lives, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but check us Saturday morning and Monday, Tuesday, and the rest of the week for devotions at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. at the same, on the same Facebook station. <laughs> so, Father, we thank you for every word that, that came out of your mouth there, Father, every word that Jesus spoke on the cross. And we apply those words to our lives right now there, Father God. We apply a fresh coat of, coat of the blood to our lives and everyone listening. Father, even now, we thank you for what you're doing there, Father God, how you're moving, how you're speaking in our lives there, Father God. Father, open our ears so we may hear you even more clearly there, Father God. Father, touch our lips so we may speak your word even more clearly there, Father God, more powerfully and profoundly, Father. So that when we come out of this, there, Father God, we shall shine with your glory there, Father God. Even as Moses shined when he came out of your presence on the mountaintop there, Father God. Let your people take your glory in all the earth there, Father God. So we thank you for it. And we ask that you will have your way and bless everyone that viewed, everyone that liked, everyone that shared, Father. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good night. Good night.